Thank you, Caroline. We're continuing our series from uh, Trusting in God, and in particular, we're looking at when life brings fear. The big question that we probably all ask at some stage is, who can we trust? Our experience of life tells us that international leaders and national leaders and even people in our own personal circles of life can't always be trusted. And once we feel we've been let down, it's pretty hard to get that trust back. Hopefully we all have a few people who are close to us that we can trust. But sometimes we have to take a risk in order to demonstrate our trust in someone. We take that risk based on what we know about that person, whether they're reliable, whether they have a reputation for being honest, whether they have a reputation for following through in what they say. In this passage from Judges chapter 7, Gideon has to trust God in a big way, in a way that doesn't seem logical, in a way that doesn't seem to be the most obvious way. And that sums God up. He is beyond human logic, and he is beyond the obvious. I don't know whether you've ever experienced the amazing logic of a child, which can take us by surprise, as even though it may may not be realistic what they're saying, their logic in arriving at their thinking can be quite staggering. For example... Have you heard of the four-year-old boy who announced to his dad that he had decided to get married? The dad replied, wonderful, do you have a girl in mind? The boy said, yes, grandma. (laughs) She said she loves me and I love her and she's the best storyteller and best cook in the whole wide world. Dad replies, that's nice but we have a small problem there. What problem, said the boy. Dad responds, she happens to be my mother. How can you marry my mother? The boy replies, why not? You married mine. (laughs) Don't you love a child's logic? The passage we're looking at today is all about the difference between God's logic and man's logic. Gideon's logic makes perfect sense, humanly speaking, particularly when in fear. But God's logic makes no sense, humanly speaking, particularly when in fear. When David the shepherd boy went out to meet Goliath, the whole of the people of Israel were in fear. None of them had volunteered to take on Goliath. And they wouldn't have given David any chance whatsoever against such a giant of a man. That's the human perspective and the human logic. But David, with God's logic and God's perspective, as he took out his catapult or sling and faced such a giant of a man, would have thought, how on earth can I miss? Logic is an attribute of God. He's not subject to logic in the sense that he's beneath it, nor is logic an invention of God. God is utterly logical, because logic is part of who he is. Logic is the set of rules that we must follow to think like God thinks, which is to think rightly. Before we home in on chapter 7 that Caroline read for us, I wanted to give you a bit of background to the passage. After the leadership of Moses and Joshua, the people of Israel lost their way and entered a dark period in their history as a result of disobedience to God. We all love to to find a hero to look up to, whether that be in the sporting world, the music world, a great teacher, a great educator, a great leader. There's no doubt in current times, Vladimir Zelensky has been a real hero figure for not just the people of Ukraine, 
but people all around the world who admire his great courage, fortitude and leadership. The book of Judges is about heroes, 12 men and women who delivered Israel from her oppressors. Most of them are not that well known, but the three most well known ones are Deborah, Samson and of course Gideon. Known as the 12 Judges, they weren't perfect and they let God down many times, just like us. But they were submissive to God and God used them as a result, as he will us. And God's deliverance of Israel through these 12 Judges over a period of 325 years is a demonstration of his love and mercy towards his people in the Old Testament but it's also a reflection of the same love and mercy he has for each one of us. Israel had to be delivered from their oppressors during this period of 325 years, time and time again. Not because God's initial deliverance wasn't long-lasting, but because the people of Israel repeated a downward spiral into disobedience and wrongdoing. That is something we all need to be careful about. We can be close to God one day, and the next day we can find ourselves on a downward spiral if we're not careful. But one thing we can all do is stand in awe of God's continual mercy as he delivers his people over and over again. Gideon was Israel's fifth judge. He had a fear that his own limitations would prevent God from using him and working through him, perhaps similar to how we might feel. When God called Gideon to save Israel, Gideon asked God in chapter 6 and verse 15, how can I save Israel? My family is the poorest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least thought of in the entire family. Gideon's response is a similar one to what we may say to God when he has a call on our life. How can you use me, God? What on earth have I got to offer? And you know what God's response was to Gideon? And what is the same response to us? God's response is, I will be with you. That is all Gideon needed to know and that is all we need to know. In Romans 8, 31, it says, if God is for us, who can stand against us? And there's a song that we sing by Chris Tomlin entitled Our God, that we're going to sing shortly, with the words that go, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? That was what Gideon was reminded of, and it's what God reminds reminds us of too. Some people say that they prefer the New Testament to the Old Testament, as the God of the Old Testament is an angry God, and the God of the New Testament is a loving God which is an understandable thing to say, but both are important. The great theologian Augustine once said about the Bible, in the Old Testament, the New Testament is concealed, and in the New Testament, the Old Testament is revealed. Scripture is not meant to be approached like a television series. For instance, you might say, I like season six of Game of Thrones much better than season two. The Bible is not like that. The story of God's grace through his people Israel to bring salvation to the world as the light of the world is a story that began not within, not with in the beginning of John chapter one in the New Testament, but with the in the beginning in Genesis chapter one in the Old Testament. In fact, when John begins his gospel with the words, in the beginning was the word, he intentionally was echoing the creation account of Genesis. 
through Jesus, the good creation that God began in Genesis is being transformed into a new creation in the New Testament. This is by means of a new exodus led by a new Moses who brings us not merely out of slavery into Egypt, but out of slavery of sin, Satan and death. And uh, death. Jesus is a new Adam who recapitulates, resets and recalibrates humanity from decay and death toward the path of redemption, reconciliation and eternal life. Without the Old Testament, we cannot understand the New Testament. And without the New Testament, we have an incomplete understanding of the Old Testament. The Old Covenant is like a gripping, powerful, epic movie, eternally set on pause, without its climax and culmination in the Christ. And the New Covenant is incomprehensible apart from what preceded it. The Old is in the New, revealed, the new is in the old, concealed. The new is the fulfilment of the old. The God of grace has been fighting for us from the beginning, running into the fray with us, so that through his people Israel, grace could extend to all nations through the Israel in person, Jesus Christ, the completion and perfection of God's love and grace for the life of the world. So having given you a bit of background, we'll return to our passage in chapter 7. God called Gideon to save the Israelites from their enemies. And in this passage, the enemies or oppressors were the Midianites, who had an army of 135,000. Gideon and his army was just 32,000. So 32,000 against 135,000, a bit of a mismatch. And human logic would say to Gideon, if you don't get more men, you've got no chance. But what does God say in his logic? The God who is so logical. God tells Gideon his army is what? Too big. Too big? Don't be nuts, God. 32,000 against 135,000? Surely... Surely we need more men. God's ways are not our ways. It says in Isaiah 55 and verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God actually gives Gideon the reason why he says his army is too big. He didn't want the Israelites to boast that they had accomplished a victory by their own strength. To believe that as underdogs they had triumphed through their own great bravery or strategy. One of the key things that God wants from us in our journey of life with him is for us to constantly give him the glory. In glorifying God, success follows. So in chapter 7 and verse 3, God tells Gideon to tell the Israelites, whoever's afraid can go home. And of the 32,000, no less than 22,000 of them clear off. And if the 22,000 that went home were fearful, I wonder what the 10,000 that remained now felt like. I expect Gideon was pretty surprised how many were afraid to fight. He probably thought only a few would leave. And surely now he would feel pretty demoralised. And I'm sure Gideon was questioning God big time about whether he really knew what he was doing. But God hadn't finished there, of course. And very often we question God big time about what is going on in our life. And the most important thing to know is that God hasn't finished yet. In Gideon's case, God wanted the odds to be so bad that the victory would clearly be his alone. 
And if we really believe the principle that not by power, but by my spirit, as it says in Zechariah 4 verse 6, then our smallness in any situation doesn't matter. In Psalm 20 verse 7, it says some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. Smallness doesn't matter, as it didn't when David faced Goliath. So in verse 4, God told Gideon that the army was still too big. Bring the army down to the river, God said, and I will test them to determine who should remain. And God told Gideon to divide uh, the men into two groups. He should keep those that drank the water by picking it up in their hands and drinking it from their hands and let those who knelt down to drink with their mouths in the river to go home. And that left only 300 men. And God said, it's with these 300 men I will bring you victory. Sometimes God has to lessen our strength so we will keep relying on him. He did that with St. Paul in the New Testament where Paul was in danger of becoming too strong for his own good. So God brought a weakness into his life recorded as a thorn in his side. And in 1 Corinthians 9, uh, chapter 12, verse 9, it says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This test that God carried out to reduce Gideon's army to 300 does seem a bit strange, and there are different ideas why God did that. But it's thought that those that cupped the water in their hands were keeping an eye on possible enemies that might be about, where those that put their mouth to the river were not um, paying any attention to perhaps being attacked by surprise. And so the, you know, the better soldiers were chosen. God assured Gideon a victory, even though he only had 300 men. The Israeli army was now less than 1% of its original size. And the proportion was 450 Midianite soldiers to every Israelite soldier. Gideon could only trust in God because there was nothing else to trust. Unsurprisingly, Gideon at this stage was even more frightened and fearful than at any other time. There's an old story about a man who was falling off a cliff and he's going to die. But as he's falling, he throws out a hand and incredibly and miraculously, he catches hold of a branch. Is anyone up there? He cries out. Yes, comes the reply. Who are you? I'm God and I'm going to save you. Wonderful. What should I do? Let go of the branch. Is anybody else up there? <laughs> I'm sure that that's exactly how Gideon felt about God at this stage. But in verse 10, God says to Gideon, what must be one of the most understated verses of the Bible, if you are afraid to attack, go to the Midian camp and listen to what the Midianites are saying, and you will be greatly encouraged. This shows that when God asks us to do something hard for him, he doesn't fold his arms and sit back and leave us to do it on our own. He's there to guide us and to keep us and to encourage us all along the way. This is the tender mercy of God. He dealt with the doubts and fears that Gideon had and he wanted to assure him. So when Gideon went to the Midianite camp, there was a man telling a dream to his companion and the man said I have had a dream to my surprise a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and it came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed then his companion answered and said this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon the son of Joash a man of Israel into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp Little did they know that Gideon only had 300 men. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped God. 
he returned to the camp of Israel and renewed in spirit and encouragement. He said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. And God used this whole situation to build the faith of Gideon. And it worked so well that all Gideon could do was worship God. And in the same way, God uses situations in our life to build our faith. Even if some of the circumstances are not pleasant and bring fear, when, but when God brings us through it, all we can do is worship him. And that is exactly the point to which God wants to bring each one of us. It was no accident that the man dreamt the dream that night. It was no accident that he told his friend about it just at that moment. And it was no accident that Gideon came to the exact place where he overheard the man telling the dream. It must have built the faith of Gideon to know that his enemies were afraid of him. When we are weak in faith, we often make our enemies stronger than they really are. Just to summarise the rest of the passage, Gideon's, Gideon's encouragement was contagious. Having received encouragement from God, he could not help but spread that encouragement to his own men. And it built their faith too. And then that led them all on to an amazing victory. By faith, Noah prepared an ark for the saving of his own household, even though there was no sign of any rain. And living by faith doesn't always make sense. But faith gives us the fortitude to endure, confident that God will work things out on our behalf. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Using our faith is the only currency that heaven recognises. Just to, seven, just to summarise in seven points. Firstly, God is logical. It's just that he uses a heavenly perspective, and so should we to overcome our fears in life. Secondly, God can use anyone who's willing to submit to him in the knowledge that he is with us to overcome our fears. Thirdly, our smallness has no relevance to God. Fourthly, remember when we don't understand what God is doing, that he hasn't finished yet, the best is yet to come. Fifthly, God expects us always to give him the glory for overcoming the odds. Sixthly, ask God for some form of encouragement to trust him when in fear. Encouragement is infectious. And seventhly, don't forget to worship God for his greatness in helping us overcome our fears and the odds we face. Amen. Mm -hmm.